Welcome to the International Accounting Standards Number no. 2 or IAS2 inventories. So in this particular paper, the inventory standard will not be tested at a very low level. It will be tested at a higher level. So mainly we are focusing on the conceptual framework requirements. So in the IAS2 inventories, there will be several requirements in the conceptual framework and one of the very important uh, conceptual framework requirements is the concept of substance over form which means in some circumstances that the form of the transaction will be in the form of inventories which means we are holding uh, to sell them in the normal course of operation in our business but the substance of that may not be inventories at all and that's the reason why we may account for the transaction under the IAS 16 property plant equipment, something like that. And after we finish the conceptual framework requirements in the IS2, I'd like to remind you about the initial measurement, which means the values that we're going to put onto the uh, financial statement for inventories. And mainly for the initial measurement, according to the conceptual framework requirements again, we are using historical cost method, which means things like the purchase price, the import duty, not refundable, these all kind of stuffs that we paid, which means the historical costs that we paid will be accounted for as inventories. And after that, perhaps we bought inventories at the year start, and what would be the value for those inventories at the year end or at the reporting date and that's the reason why we are looking at the subsequent measurement for those inventories. For the subsequent measurement we may account for uh, impairment for inventories uh, and we have to follow a particular concept here is the lower of costs and net realizable value and of course we'll be touching about for example, the accounting policies relating to cost. For example, you can use the first in, first out or five-fold method or the weighted average cost method in a cost calculation. And also the accounting estimate in determining the net realizable value by taking the estimated selling price and to subtract the estimated cost complete and sold, the inventories as well. So these are the stuff that we'll be focusing on in this particular paper. So let's get started by first having a go at the conceptual framework requirements for inventories. So very importantly is the concept of substance which means what has really happened over its legal form. So uh, according to the definition of IS2 inventories, inventories are those items including raw materials, work in progress, which means the partly finished goods, and 100% finished goods, uh, that we are, that those are the stuff that we held for sale. Because we bought it in the first place, and then we hold those items in order to sell them. But in this particular paper, it's just to be a form of the transaction. We are holding it for resale purposes. And what will be the substance of that? The best way to go through this is to have a go at a uh, case study. It's a case study, uh, the car dealer. So, for example, we manufacture a car and we allow the car dealer to sell those cars on our behalf. For example, we think about Toyota. So here is a case about those test drive vehicles. So a car dealer has several test drive vehicles in the car showroom. Um, the question is whether we should classify the test drive vehicles as inventories or as property plant equipment. It really depends on the concept of substance over form. Here, these vehicles cannot be returned back to the manufacturer. It seems that we've controlled those vehicles already. And to a certain extent, that meets with the definition of an asset. 
but whether it is the inventory offset or the PPE offset. So let's see. The car dealer usually keeps three test drive vehicles in the car showroom to improve the sales of similar models. Oh, the purpose of keeping those uh, test drive vehicles is not to resell it to, to, to make a huge profit, but to simply boost sales of similar car models. When these cars are finally sold to customers, usually at a 20% off discount to the normal selling price. Or we can see that the selling price is not at the market price. It's 20% off the normal selling price. It seems to me the discount can normally be seen in uh, such industries when cars are delivered to the internal employees uh, at such a large discount, 20% off is a huge discount from my perspective in this particular industry. These cars are not frequently sold to customers unless there are not enough cars in the warehouse to be delivered to customers and when we sold those cars, for example the three test drive vehicles, we may repurchase three test drive vehicles from the manufacturer okay, and fill them in the warehouse again if they are sold. And in this case, according to my observation, the substance of the transaction indeed is not inventory. Because first of all, I'd like to consider the frequency of sales. The frequency of sales is not quite frequent. Only three vehicles in there. At the same time, they're normally not sold until or unless we haven't got enough cars to, to, to be sold to customers. And second, how about the revenue? The percentage of revenue accounted for the total revenue in our business. And it seems that the revenue, first of all, we got uh, only three test drive vehicles, first of all, is unlikely to be accounted for a large amount of revenue in our total revenue when we are selling cars in our ordinary course of operation. In this case, low. And third, how about the price that we charge? The price we charge not close to the market price. And in this case, I would rather recognize these test drive vehicles as PPE instead of inventories. And from my perspective, I will account for the test drive vehicles according to I-16, property plant equipment, or you can call it the PPE as the long-term asset in our SFP. Although the legal form of the transaction is like inventories, but the substance of that is like the PPE. We should account for the transaction according to the substance rather than according to the legal form. And that's a very important concept that we have to bear in mind. Okay, so after we understand the conceptual framework requirement, yes, we've got other conceptual framework requirements again. When we look at the, the later questions, so for example, we've got the prudence concept because the inventories may be impaired, and we've got the accruals concept for those inventories which can't be sold, we should remove those unsold inventories from the cost of sales according to the matching principle or we can call it as the accruals concept. But we will look at them when we get to it, when we come to the case studies later on. So after we finish the conceptual framework requirements, now let's look at the initial measurement of inventories according to the IAS number two. A very important concept that you have to bear in mind is referring back to the conceptual framework requirements again. It is according to the historical cost method, which means that the price that we pay for according to the invoice, according to the contract, and we should account for the transaction by taking that value into our financial statement. And typically, that the inventory cost we include, first of all, is the purchase price, which means the price that we purchase or acquire those inventories. And 
Sometimes we may buy those inventories uh, from other countries, which means we import those inventories. In this case, we may have to pay for the import duty. But remember, in some countries, the import duty may be refunded by the government. And here, in order to be the value onto the financial statement for those inventories, that the import duty should be not refundable. If that's refundable, that's not a cost at all. So import duty, not refundable, to be put onto the inventory value. At the same time, we buy inventories, we have to pay, or we may pay, the transportation cost. In other words, it's like the carriage inwards. We have to pay for something in order to bring the inventory into the present location in our business. At the same time, we may have to incur additional handling costs. For example, moving that inventory from this area to that area for us to operate it. In other words, we are incurring costs to bring the inventory into the present condition. In other words, costs are incurred to bring the inventory into the present location and condition, we're going to put them onto the uh, inventory value, which means we capitalize it. And for some inventories, for example, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, biological products, we may also include, uh, incur the specific storage costs as well to store those products uh, at a particular agreed standard. And these costs can be traced directly to that product and should be capitalised as the purchase cost. For those inventories that we uh, are not acquiring them from the external source, we may, uh, for those inventories, we may produce it uh, on our own turning the raw materials into the work in progress and finally the finished goods by incurring something called conversion costs. Those conversion costs can be capitalised if they are related to the inventories. For example, the direct labour costs that we incur in paying the labour into turning the raw materials into the work in progress or WIP and then the finished goods and also production overhead, for example, the depreciation expenses related to the factory or the equipment. At the same time, the electricity expenses or the maintenance expenses incurred in the factory to turning those raw materials into the finished goods. And these are the conversion costs that needs to be capitalised as part of the inventory's cost. Okay. So, these are the initial measurement. So, let's say that we've incurred $100 of the purchase cost, we incur $20 of the conversion cost, so the total historical cost will be 100 plus 20, and that will be 120 as the initial cost that we capitalise onto our financial statement. So, usually, that we debit purchases of 120 and credit cash or accounts payable of 120. But in other circumstances, we debit inventories of 120. It really depends of where, on whether uh, you use the periodic uh, inventory system or the perpetual inventory system, but that does not uh, uh, cause a problem in this particular paper. But here, we bear in mind that the inventory cost will be 120 in total, and now let's Let's focus on the final bit, which is the subsequent measurement of inventories. Which means at the reporting date, we're going to see whether the inventory value is still 120 or not. And according to the IAS2 inventories, I'm referring back to the conceptual framework requirements. Here is according to the concept called prudence. According to the prudence concept, 
that the imagery should be measured at the lower of cost and net realizable value. So what does that mean then? So suppose that we got different categories of inventories. Of course, this is quite usual in a business. Some inventories may have similar characteristics that we group them together as the first category of inventories. And the second type of inventory will have a slightly different characteristic from the, uh, from the first group. And we take them to the second group of inventories. So for example, we've got two groups of inventories. The first group inventories, the cost will be, uh, let's say, 60, and then 60 for the second group. So total cost, uh, as you've seen before, is 120. But for the first group of inventories, the net realized value, which means the expected selling price minus the expected cost, which means the expected amount of money that you can obtain on hand when you sold those inventories in the future, but not now but you are expecting to sell those images into the future, what would be the net amount of cash that you can receive? So for example, for the first type of inventories, that we expect to receive only 30, and the second type of inventories, we can expect to receive 70. So in other words, for the first group of inventories, we should value at the lower, which means NRV, but for the second, we should value at the cost. So in other words, the total value for those inventories, we should take 30 and then 60, so it comes to 90. So the 90 is the combination of cost of 60 and the NRV of 30. And that's why we use the word and, which means the total value of inventories will be 90, which means and. But for individual inventories, we should use 60 or 30, 60 or 70, which is lower, but total value should be and. And in this case, according to the prudence concept, prudence, which means we can't overstate the asset value and we can't understate the liability value. And in this case, we can't overstate $120 for those inventories because we expect that the amount that we can get when we sell those inventories will simply be a total of $90 instead of being $120. And in this case, as you can see, there should be a $30 of reduction of those inventories, which means the inventories are impaired. So you may have learned the IAS 36, the impairment of non current asset. And should we apply the I-36 in this particular case? Well, the answer is certainly no, we can't. For inventories impairment, according to the IAS-2, it should be a lower of cost in NRV. If the amount of money that we can obtain from selling those inventories are lower than cost, which means the inventory has been automatically impaired, and that's why we account for the impairment for those inventories only according to the IAS number 2 instead of according to the IAS number 36. And that's a very important concept that we should bear in mind. Okay, but the question is, how are we going to account for that $30 of inventories impairment? Well, the accounting journals would be, we are charging that $30 by debiting the cost of sales, charging it directly to the p and as the impairment of 30, and then we're going to credit the inventories value from our statement of financial position or SFP by $30 by bringing down the current asset value by $30. Okay, so here's the thing how can we calculate the NRV or net realizable value if you take the first letter okay, from each word? Well, to calculate the net realizable value, or NRV, we take the expected selling price, 
which means the selling price that we're expecting to sell those inventories, I mean minus the expected cost to complete and sell those inventories. Now what does that mean? Well, in a business, we have the normal selling price to be charged onto our customer. And this can be referred to as the expected selling price. But some students have asked me a question. Well, expected selling price, are there fair values? So, should we account for the expected selling price according to the IFRS 13 fair value measurement? Which means, should we take the market price as the fair value to be expected selling price? No, we shouldn't. According to IS2 inventories, we should account for the expected selling price only according to the IS2 inventories. So let me just to give you an example. I can sell this pen if I'm a management team in a business. If I were to sell this pen, the normal selling price would be $10. Perhaps for this particular inventory, I would like to sell it at 1 instead of selling it at 10. Because for some of the businesses, they may use different pricing strategy to win the market share. So for example, in this case, I may use the predatory pricing to artificially set our selling price at a very low level. For example, instead of selling at 10, I'm selling at 1. Because I like to drive my competitors out from the market. And in this case, the expected selling price is not the market price in the active market that we can see $10. No, we should use our best estimate according to our strategy, which means $1 in this case. And that's why when we are determining the net realizable value for those inventories, it is an example of accounting estimate. It's just to be the estimate by considering all sorts of strategic matters in our business where we're setting up the NRV value. At the same time, we will have to consider the expected cost to complete the inventory if that's damaged. At the same time, we also have to take into account any additional commission expenses that we have to pay to our sales staff in order to sell this type of inventory. So, for example, if the estimated cost to complete and sell the inventory is a total of 0.2 dollar, so the NRV would be 1 minus 0.2, giving us 0.8 dollars would be the value of the NRV. So, a very important concept indeed. So, if, for example, as you can see, the first type of inventory initially is $60 of cost, but now the NRV is 30, which means we have to take the NRV value worth of 30 as the inventory value. In other words, the inventory value has decreased from 60 down to 30 by $30. This is an impairment. So in other words, when NRV is lower than cost, this means that there are some problems with the inventory. So for example, as you can see, the inventory may become obsolete. For example, if you can, if you can see the high fashion clothes, uh, they are obsolete, cannot be sold because uh, the, the, the uh, latest items have been introduced in the market. Or the inventory may get damaged. As a result, the NRV is lower than cost. So in some businesses, they may try to overstate their net realizable value so that the inventory will not be impaired. Because as I said to you before, when inventories are impaired, that the NRV is quite low. But some businesses may try to overstate the NRV. There will be several unethical ways that we can do. So for example, normally we sell those products at $10 but now I would like to sell it at $3. So why not just to hide the quotation to the customer? For example, hide the 
uh, source document. Or perhaps we're going to overstate the estimated selling price only at the reporting date. And then after a few months later, we're going to adjust the selling price a little bit further, a little bit, uh, adjust the selling price down a little bit further. Alternatively, there might be some uh, estimated cost to complete and sell those products. And why not just to exclude these additional costs? So we're going to make the NRV larger. And also we're going to understate the commissions that we're going to pay to our staff. Because in most businesses, for example, those discretionary costs, such as training costs and commission expenses, uh, would be an example of the accrued expense. And some businesses may try to use these to window dress the financial statement. When they see that the profit is quite high, uh, pay lots of taxes, they may try to uh, reduce the profit by increasing the uh, accrued expenses and the corresponding expenses, for example, the commission expenses. So trying to understate the selling expense, yes, some businesses can do it. So these ways are commonly known as the unethical behaviour. You're trying to window dress your financial statements to make your financial statements look better. Okay, now... Here's the thing, for those inventories being impaired, which means the NRV is quite low, but perhaps as economy recovers later on, and can we reverse those impairment losses back? Yes, we can do it. But here's the principle. When we are reversing those uh, inventories uh, right down, we cannot exceed the previous cumulative inventories value written down. So here's an example. In the first year, that the cost of inventory is 15, the NRV is 12. NRV is quite low, which means the inventory has been impaired. Impaired by how much? 12 minus 15 by $3. Impaired by $3. Which means they recognise the uh, accu accumulate, uh, accumulative impairment losses worth of $3 by charging cost of sales of 3 and decreasing the inventory value by $3. So the accumulated uh, impairment losses would be worth of $3 at this particular stage. So now let's look at the second year. So the cost of inventory is 15 but the NRV is 18 which means NRV is higher which means there'll be no inventory impairment right now. If there are no impairments right now, what we can do is to say we can reverse the previous $3, okay, by debiting the inventories back, by increasing it up, and to reduce the cost by $3. That's how we do it, of the impairment reversal. But can we say that the $3 is because we take 18 of the NRV minus the cost of 15. No. So for example, if the NRV, I change that to, let's say, $100. So if that's the case, the impairment loss that we can reverse still is just to be $3 that we recognised before. Okay? So that's the rule. Okay. Now finally, we're going to be looking at another conceptual framework requirement is the consistency requirement. So as we can see, the subsequent measurement for that is the lower of cost and NRV. So now let's see the cost first of all. In determining the cost of the inventories, of course, though we said before, we use the historical cost method, including the purchase price and also the conversion cost. But later on, if we can see the inventories are homogeneous, which means they are very much the same from one to another. So, for example, in the oil industries, the each litre of oil would be quite similar to each other. And the retail businesses, each bottle of milk would be quite similar to each other. And if that's the case, in determining that cost, in order to match the flow of cost with its 
physical flow, we may use the first in, first out, or the FIFO method, or sometimes we may use weighted average cost method in determining that cost. And we can see here, for consistency reason, if inventories have similar characteristic, you have to use the same cost method, which means for the inventory type number one, we use FIFO, type number two, we use weight after cost, and this will be fine. But we can't say within the type number one, because part of the inventory is based in the uh, southeast, and uh, part of our inventory in the type number one is based on the, for example, uh, northeast area. Because they are based in different geographical locations, and we can use different uh, costing formula. Is this allowed? No, it is not allowed by the ICE number two. Okay, so make sure that you're ready for that. Okay, so in this particular sections that we've gone through, the IAS2 in particular, the three areas, including conceptual framework, initial measurement, and subsequent measurement. In our next hour section, we'll be looking at a few case studies related to the, uh, relating to the ICE number two inventories in much more detail. See you soon. Bye. APC, accounting for your future.